Eileen Cotter was born in 1952, three years after her parents moved from Ireland to England. Her father, Patrick Cotter, was a laborer. In 1967, 15-year-old Eileen found the body of her mother, who sadly took her own life. Eileen left school at 16 and worked at a holiday camp in Barry Island in Wales. Later on, she found work at a care home in Ireland. Just after 2 p.m. on June 1, 1974, a resident at a block of apartments in Hamilton Park Highbury, North London, saw what she thought was a bundle of rags in the courtyard next to a block of garages. Another resident realized it was a body and asked her father to call the police. When police arrived at the scene, they documented that the female body was lifeless. The body was identified as Eileen Cotter's. She was 22 years old at the time. Eileen was found strangled with her one eye black and bruises on her face and neck. She was lying face down with her lower body exposed and her underwear and tights pulled down. Her handbag, glasses, and shoes were missing. Eileen Connor's father released a statement detailing his daughter's short life marred by family tragedies after her body was found. A forensic examination was done on her body. A pathologist found that the cause was manual strangulation. DNA samples were recovered from two places on Eileen's body. The DNA was used to extract DNA profiles. No matches could be made at the time. Police interviewed 92 potential suspects and carried out an extensive operation to identify local curb crawlers in their effort to find the attacker. Unfortunately, he was not identified and her case went unsolved. In 2012, 37 years after Eileen's body was found, the investigation was reopened. Following advances in DNA profiling, the trail went cold for seven more years until 2019 when John Applegren came to the attention of police for attacking his wife and Smythe Applegren. He lived in the same area as Eileen when the crime was committed. John Applegren is an 80-year-old pensioner who was formerly a minicab driver and a bricklayer. He is from South Africa and had previously been married in South Africa to a woman with whom he had two children. It is not clear if and Smythe Applegren is his second or third wife, as there are no details of a second wife, although many sources call and his third wife. It was in February 2019 that he was arrested for domestic assault by his then wife and Applegren. There was a breakthrough when police took Applegren's DNA for the first time. The sample was a billion to one probability of a match to the DNA collected from Eileen Cotter's body. When interviewed, he claimed that he did not know Eileen, but accepted he had relations with other women during his marriage. On June 22, 2022, John Applegren was arrested and charged with the slaying of Eileen Cotter. The arrest was made after investigators concluded that Applegren is 100% responsible for what happened to Eileen. Detective Chief Inspector Lawrence Smith said that if someone knocked on his door and arrested him for a crime of almost 50 years ago, he would repeatedly plead his innocence until he could no longer speak. That was not him. He was very calm about it. He had an aura of, dare I say, evilness about him. Applegren appeared at the Bromley Magistrates Court on Thursday, June 23, 2022, where he was remanded into custody. The judge fixed a trial of up to four weeks from June 6, 2023. Opening the prosecution's case, Prosecutor Alexandra Healy said that DNA samples taken from Eileen's body in 1975 matched those of John Applegren of Brighton Close in Sydenham, southeast London. During the trial, she told jurors that in 2019, Applegren had come to the attention of police for attacking his wife. The court heard Applegren was seen on the night of the slaying in 1975 at a Finsbury Park hot dog stall where Eileen would often go. Ms. Healy also told the jury that it appeared Eileen had been pushed out of a car after she and Applegren had intercourse. She described to the court, without shoes and with her tights and underwear still around her right leg. Applegren hit Eileen in the face and throttled her before throwing her body out of his car. The defendant was 31 at the time. This happened just six weeks after the birth of his first child with his then-wife, Anne. Applegren told police in 1975 when he was interviewed as a potential suspect. That he was living in Leighton and never went to the Finsbury Park and Highbury area, which was a lie. Ms. Healy also said Eileen did not have the defendant's DNA on her underwear and tights because she never pulled them up after they were together. She never pulled them up because she was not alive anymore. 
During the court case, it was revealed that Eileen and Anne were most definitely not Applegren's only victims. Applegren assaulted an 18-year-old female guest at his own wedding to Anne Applegren on October 14, 1972. Ms. Healy told jurors the incident only came to light years later when police interviewed Anne Applegren as part of the reinvestigation into Eileen's case in 2012. Ms. Healy told jurors that Applegren had pushed the 18-year-old woman against the wall. After she left the toilet at his wedding reception and assaulted her. The victim had not told anyone about the incident as she was afraid she would be blamed. The teenager told Anne Applegren about the assault after the pair later divorced. Anne Applegren, mother of two, also revealed that she had been mistreated and that Applegren had once grabbed her neck with both hands. She added that she believed he was cheating on her just months after their 1972 marriage and later found out he was sleeping with her brother's wife. After 11 hours of jury deliberation, Mrs. Justice may announce the jury's final decision. She told Applegren that putting your hands around a young woman's neck and squeezing hard carried a high risk which ought to have been obvious. The judge added Eileen must have been terrified. The jury found Applegren guilty on Friday, June 16, 2023, following a two-week trial. In addition to being found guilty of manslaughter, he was also convicted of indecent assault. Justice May then sentenced Applegren to 10 years for manslaughter and a further six months for the earlier assault. To run consecutively. This means he will be eligible for release on parole after five years and three months on June 21, 2028, when he is 85 and hopefully worm food. In mitigation, Justin Rouse listed Applegren's health problems, saying the defendant would be affected significantly by serving his sentence. Detective Chief Inspector Lawrence Smith said Eileen's life was tragically ended at a young age, with her body then discarded onto the street. When my team reviewed the original investigation, we were impressed by how thorough it was. Investigators at the time used every available method to find the suspect, including operations with decoy women. This was a tactic used at the time where female police officers under protection were placed at the scenes of crimes in efforts to draw out predatory men. Smith continued, unfortunately, they did not have the science available to us now, and although he should have been in prison decades ago, he has now been brought to justice. Investigating violence against women and girls is a priority for the Metropolitan Police and we will relentlessly pursue predatory men, whether a crime took place decades ago or today. Eileen's half-brother, Patrick Cotter, who was five at the time of her demise, said in a statement, I was not only deprived of a sister I had little time to get to know, the knock-on effect also meant I lost my mother who took her own life and my father to mental illness and alcoholism. This was all brought about because John Applegren took Eileen's life. Three years after Eileen's strangling, my mother took her own life as the relationship between her and my father broke down significantly. Due to the fighting between them, I was placed in a care home where I suffered abuse until the age of about 11. It was never explained to me why I was placed in care, and I lived most of my childhood believing it is because of something I had done wrong. His statement continues, again, being a young child, I struggled to understand with little explanation given to me. My father drank heavily. But Eileen's demise and the loss of my mother caused him to drink even more, and he was eventually admitted to Springfield Psychiatric Hospital. Following this, my father went to live with his brother in Ireland. However, his drinking became too much and he also passed away. According to Patrick Cotter Jr., he has no memory of Eileen's funeral and has no idea whether she was buried or cremated. He also has no idea where she was laid to rest. As a result, he had never been able to visit her grave. Patrick continued, I spent a very unhappy childhood moving amongst various care homes and foster homes. However, when I was 14 years old, I was placed with my foster parents, John and Yvonne. I was very fortunate to be placed in a loving, caring home. They explained various aspects of my life that I did not know or understand, filling in the gaps, so to speak. I also had a half-brother from my mother who was 17 years older than me. However, when I was taken into care, he was told to avoid any contact with me. I felt as though I lost him as well. He was someone I was very fond of and have happy memories of. Was also taken from me. Patrick Cotter concluded, I would like to see justice for Eileen, whose life was cruelly cut short 49 years ago. 
As a result of the traumatic event during my childhood, I shut down emotionally. It has made it difficult for me to form close relationships. I only have very faint memories of my sister, but I believe she cared for me. Heidi Marie Erickson was born on December 14, 1984 in St. Paul, Minnesota. She was the daughter of John and Linda Erickson and had two brothers, Peter and Joel. Heidi committed her life to Jesus Christ as a young girl and faithfully walked with him. She was described as a joyful child of God. She loved and was loved by her family and many wonderful friends. In 2005, Heidi met Nick Firks at church, hit it off, and they got married soon after. Nick was born February 25, 1983, and is the son of Steve and Julie Firks. Heidi found work at Securian, a financial services company, while Nick Firks was the director of operations for a carpet cleaning business. Heidi and Nick Firks were both close with their parents. In 2010, the couple had been dealing with financial difficulties and were about to be evicted from their home. They were in over $15,000 of credit card debt. Heidi knew none of this, however. Out of shame, Nick did not tell anyone about their financial situation. Early in the morning on April 25, 2010, at approximately 6.30, 25-year-old Heidi made a 911 call from her cell phone. She frantically said that someone's trying to break into their home. She could be heard breathing heavily and screaming. It was clear she was terrified. The call ended abruptly with a loud noise. Just 65 seconds later, another 911 call was made from their home, this time from her husband, 27-year-old Nick Firks. My wife is shot. Someone broke into our house. Nick screamed into the phone. I've been shot. When officers arrived at the scene, they found Nick with a gunshot wound to his left thigh. He was beside Heidi on the floor, talking to the 911 operator. He was highly emotional and was taken to the hospital. Heidi had been fatally shot in the upper back. Her body was found in the kitchen. Investigators noticed that the Furcus house was clean and tidy, and the entryway table beside the front door was undisturbed. They could not find any signs of a struggle taking place or anyone that forced themselves into the house. Nick Furcus told Sergeant Jim Gray of the ST. Paul Police Department that he awoke to a suspicious noise at his front door, grabbed his shotgun from and alerted his sleeping wife. Both of them were trying to run out the back door to the detached garage to escape, according to Nick. Heidi stopped next to the front door to grab her wallet, which was on the table next to the front door. At that moment, the door opened and there was a guy around 6 feet 1 inch or 6 feet 2 inches with a dark hooded sweatshirt with the hood drawn tight around his face. Nick Furcus said that the guy grabbed the barrel of the shotgun, they wrestled, and that his finger slipped onto the trigger and it went off. The gunshot hit Heidi and she fell onto the floor. Nick Furcus and the intruder struggled over the shotgun and the gun went off a second time, hitting Nick in the leg. He fell down and the intruder took off through the front door. He told police that they were about to lose their house because they were behind on their bills. He said that they had not told any of their friends or family about the foreclosure or their need to be out of their house, but that they were going to tell their parents and friends and were planning to move later that day. According to him, they had planned to pack up their house on Sunday and Monday morning, put some of their belongings in the garage to get later, and find someone to stay with. Photographs and a video taken inside the Furka's home after the incident showed that despite having to be out of the house the next day, absolutely no packing had been done. Also, Heidi was scheduled to work on Monday, April 26. She did not request a day off. On Thursday, April 22, 2010, three days before her life was ended, Heidi exchanged text messages with a friend, making plans to get a pedicure in the afternoon on Sunday, April 25th. In this exchange, Heidi was given the option of doing the pedicure on Sunday or the following Wednesday, and Heidi chose Sunday. She also suggested that they all go to church together that Sunday morning. It was evident that Heidi knew nothing about the eviction or that they had to move to a new place. Heidi's funeral took place at the Calvary Church in Roseville, Minnesota, a week after she lost her life. Many messages sympathizing with her parents, Nick, and their family streamed in. She was remembered as a beautiful young woman and the community was deeply saddened. 
On her tombstone, the words, Joyful Child of God, are engraved. Extensive neighborhood canvassing and a canine search showed no sign of an intruder. He was never found. Investigators did note that Nick Firks perpetuated several false accounts to them during interviews. He became a suspect in the case when the police found no signs of a forced break-in or any missing items. There were also no background noises that indicated there was an intruder. Or a struggle taking place when investigators looked into the audio of the two 911 calls made. Investigators also found only Nick Furka's DNA on the gun and several witnesses testified there were no signs of a break-in. Nick Furka's attorneys claimed the intruder was wearing gloves and was in the home for only a couple of seconds so he could not have left DNA evidence. Nick Furkus retained the services of a defense attorney, Joe Friedberg, who recommended he cease contact with the ST. Paul Police Department At the advice of his lawyer, Nick Furkus declined investigators' requests to sit down with a police sketch artist to create a composite of the alleged intruder. I knew they had used that as a lever to try interrogating him more, so I said, no, we won't do that. But we'll hire an artist and do it, Friedberg told ABC News. Nick Firks and Joe Friedberg returned to the ST. Paul's police department with their own sketch of the alleged intruder, who Nick Firks said was a male in his late 30s and wearing a hoodie. The police released the sketch through the media to see if any tips would come in. A woman identified Michael P. to police as a potential match. Investigators started researching him immediately, and they learned that he was engaged in a pattern of breaking into homes in ST. Paul around 6 in the morning. However, Michael Pye was incarcerated on the day of Heidi slaying. Authorities subsequently cleared him of having any involvement in this case. A few months after Heidi's demise, Nick Furkus met with a man Rachel Watson. She believed he was the man of her dreams. Rachel is described as a loving, caring, and generous individual who is always ready to extend a helping hand. She is also known for her kind and amicable behavior, which helps her maintain positive relationships with everyone around her. Also born in Minnesota, Rachel got to know Nick Furkus on a personal level through her sister Sarah and her brother-in-law, David Olson, who were both close friends of Heidi. In fact, Sarah considered herself one of Heidi's best friends, and she was the one to insist that Nick Furkus was a wonderful man who loved and took care of his first wife without fail. Neither Sarah nor David minded when Rachel fell in love with him. Before deciding to tie the knot. The two got married in August, 2012 and moved into a house purchased for them by Nick Furk's parents. They welcomed their first child just a few months later. Neighbors who were acquainted with the couple claimed they appeared utterly in love. And they even went on to become proud parents of two more wonderful children. Yet with time, Rachel began doubting her husband's involvement in Heidi's case. Her suspicion about her husband's involvement with what happened to Heidi were raised when she found a notice that they might lose their home to foreclosure due to unpaid property taxes. Nick and Rachel Furkus had an arrangement where they would pay the mortgage amount to Nick Furkus' parents and he would pay the property taxes directly to the county. She immediately thought of what she had heard about Heidi's demise. According to Rachel, I didn't know that this was happening and I'm living with this person. I have children with this person and the last time he had problems with finances, a lot of things went wrong, she said in an interview. She decided to confront him about it. Because she feared for her life as well, she sent their children away and even decided to the whole conversation before talking to Nick. Although Nick Firk said nothing incriminating while talking to his spouse, it was apparent he was hiding something. In one recording, Rachel said, the fact that you're lying was so easy for you to do in front of me over and over and over makes me think. That I could end my wife's life? He responded. She replied yes. This worry kept nagging Rachel until she could not take it anymore and divorced him in 2019. Rachel told ABC's 20 to 20 that catching Nick Furkus in a substantially similar lie was what led her to see the 2010 event in an entirely new light. In 2019, Sergeant Nicole Sipes of the ST. Paul Police Department took a new look at Heidi the case always bothered me because the circumstances did not seem to fit what happened, Sipes said. Once Sipes learned of Nick Firk's recent divorce from his second wife, she reached out to Rachel, who shared her suspicions. She could have also been a victim, Sipes said. 
In May 2021, Nick Firks was arrested and for the first time officially charged with taking his first wife's life. The investigation showed Nick Ferkus was served with foreclosure in June 2009, and their house was sold at a sheriff's auction in the same month, 10 months before Heidi was slayed. Eviction proceedings had been filed in February, and an eviction hearing was held on March 8, 2010, which Nick Ferkus attended alone. The lockout date was originally set for April 9, 2010. Nick Ferks called the attorneys and stated his grandmother was in hospice and asked to move it to April 26. However, investigators found no evidence either of his grandmothers were in hospice or passed away in 2010. In a review of correspondence between the couple and financial documents found in the home, investigators were unable to find any proof that Heidi knew of the impending eviction. Nick Ferk's trial started in February 2022. Defense attorneys argued Heidi knew about the foreclosure and impending eviction. Prosecutors, on the other hand, said she did not know, and her husband was desperate. Nick Ferks, the complaint said, had done absolutely no packing and kept Heidi completely in the dark about the fact that they were about to be evicted on April 26, 2010, which was one day after the slaying. Investigators have reviewed the text messages and emails sent to and from Heidi and Nick Ferkus' cell phones and email accounts. There is not a single message that references foreclosure or eviction proceedings or gives any indication that they would need to move out of their house imminently. On the contrary, on March 11, 2010, wish we weren't tied down to our house so we could move somewhere fun. The law firm handling the foreclosure and eviction has no documentation signed by Heidi, and their representatives never had any contact with Heidi. All their contacts were with Nick Ferkies. Investigators have spoken with Heidi's family, friends, and co-workers, and not one person said that Heidi ever said anything about foreclosure, eviction, or eviction, or needing a place to stay or store their belongings. In April 2010, Heidi emailed Nick Ferks multiple times regarding scheduling a meeting with a realtor who helped them buy their house and who was referred to as JS and also a friend from church. Nick Ferks responded by saying that he had been in contact with JS on April 23, 2010. Heidi sent Nick Ferks an email asking whether he had heard from JS. Nick Ferks responded, JS said that he's ready to meet when we are. I told him Monday should be good. Police interviewed JS who said that he had not spoken to Nick Ferks in over a year and that there was no meeting scheduled for any Monday. The FBI also combined their ballistics testing and a virtual model of Heidi and Nick Ferkus house to prove that the shots were most likely not accidental in the middle of the struggle, but deliberate. However, Nick Ferkus attorney countered that these findings did not necessarily disprove his version of the events. Finally, the prosecutor asked the big question. Did you have anything to do with the incident in which Heidi lost her life? No, Nick Ferkus said. Absolutely not. Ramsey County prosecutors argued that Nick Ferkus hid details of their financial troubles from his wife and took her life due to the shame of their impending eviction. It wasn't just going to be the loss of his house. It was going to be the realization that he had lied to his wife. And he had lied to his friends. He had lied to the community for many years, Ramsey County Assistant District Attorney Elizabeth Lamon said. He took Heidi's life and saved his reputation. Senior Assistant Hennepin County Attorney Rachel Craker said at the trial where she aided Ramsey County prosecutors in securing the conviction. The trial lasted 11 days. On February 10, 2023, after four hours of deliberation, the jury found Nick Ferkus guilty of slaying Heidi. Robert Richmond, Nick Ferkus defense attorney, refuted these allegations, but nevertheless, he was found guilty on all the charges against him. In April, 2023, Ferkus was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. It took more than a decade for this case to be solved, and it could very well have still been unsolved if Ferkus was not caught in a big lie by his second wife, Rachel. Nick Ferkus' family declined a request from ABC News for an interview, but issued a statement in support of him. He was wrongly convicted and sits in jail for a crime he did not commit. This is not just the belief of heartbroken parents a part of the statement. Reads, after 13 years, Heidi's family and friends found some sort of closure. 
They had this to say in a statement, because of the lies we were told as early as the day after her life was ended, along with the pressures to believe them, it has been virtually impossible to find closure to our grief as the shock begins after what happened to Heidi. The realization quickly set in that everything Nick Firks was telling us betrayed who I knew my sister to be, Heidi's brother, Peter Erickson said. The fact that he had the audacity to peddle a story that was so obviously inconsistent with Heidi's character was, and still is, very much insulting and offensive to me and everyone else who actually knew and loved her. I really miss my sister, he added. Heidi's mom, Linda Erickson, holding back tears, said, Nick Firk's unthinkable actions robbed her daughter and loved ones of participating in that adventure of life with her. She looked forward to being a mother, she said of Heidi. Because of Nick Firks, I never get to see my friend again, Jesse Bain added. Because of him, Heidi is missing out on so much. At present, Rachel still resides in ST. Paul, Minnesota, where she owns and operates her own cosmetics company, Be Lovely. On top of it, she is also a vocal advocate for victims of human trafficking. In fact, reports indicate that Be Lovely donates 10% of each sale to organizations that work for victims of trafficking and other social injustices. It honestly is great to witness Rachel's success. Nick Furkas is serving his life sentence without parole at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Morgan Bauer was born on April 13, 1996 in Memphis, Tennessee. She was the only child of Sherry Keenan and an unknown father. Morgan grew up in Aberdeen, South Dakota and graduated from Central High School in 2014. She was a pretty girl with blue eyes and brown hair. Morgan had a passion for music and art. And aspired to become a tattoo artist. She had a number of tattoos herself. One of those tattoos was a butterfly that symbolized her freedom and transformation. Her other tattoos were a sun moon near her right shoulder inside a Celtic design, an anchor with the words, whatever you love can be taken away so live like it's your last day on her left wrist. A blue and orange jellyfish on her arm from her inner wrist to elbow, and a black tree and flowers on the back of her neck. She also had her ears gauged and her lip pierced twice. Morgan was an avid reader and writer, enjoying books from all different genres. She also wrote poems and stories on her blog. And had been dancing since she was three years old. She participated in various competitions and shows. She started dating Jose Rodriguez when she turned 18. The two of them met online. Morgan also had a dream of becoming a journalist or photographer. She always carried her camera with her. Morgan was active on different social media platforms. She posted photos of herself and her friends, as well as inspirational quotes and memes, especially on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. She had thousands of followers who admired her beauty and personality. Morgan loved to travel and explore new places. She had visited 13 states in the US and had plans to visit more. She decided to leave the small town of Aberdeen in South Dakota and move to Atlanta, Georgia in search of a new independent life. She left on February 12, 2016. Morgan had a pet cat named Luna whom she adored. She adopted Luna from a shelter and left the cat with her mother when she moved. She stayed with a man she had met on Craigslist for the first night in Atlanta. Their arrangement included that Morgan cleaned the house until she managed to find a job. Unfortunately, this agreement did not work out between the two roommates. She then stayed at different hotels. Morgan took a job as a dancer in a Gainesville, Georgia club called the Top of Gainesville. She and her mother were in contact every day or every other day through social media or phone calls. Morgan also remained in contact with friends until February 25, 2016. It was then that she abruptly went silent. On that specific evening, she was dancing at Top of Gainesville. Afterwards, Morgan, Morgan's co-worker, and her co-worker's boyfriend all left the club together. They dropped Morgan off at the Sitgo gas station in Covington, where she got into a green eclipse with an unknown driver. That would be the last time Morgan was seen alive. Her mom, Sherry Keenan, became concerned when she could not reach Morgan. She decided to go to Atlanta to find Morgan. Sherry went to the last motel that Morgan was staying in. There she found that all of Morgan's luggage was still in place. This indicated to her that Morgan did not run away. 
Sherry then talked to Morgan's boyfriend, Jose Rodriguez, to hear if he knew anything about where she could possibly be. Jose told her that he loved Morgan and was worried about her safety as well. He also said that he had not seen her or heard from her. On March 8, 2016, after not hearing from Morgan for over a week, Sherry Keenan reported her daughter as missing to the Atlanta Police Department. According to her cell phone records, officers determined that Morgan's last phone call was made to Jose on February 25, 2016. In Morgan's last Instagram video, she was seen walking in the Yellow River Park in Newton County, Georgia. An unidentified man could be seen walking behind her. Morgan's Instagram was private, but Sherry Keenan said a friend of her daughter sent her a screenshot of Morgan's last post. It showed that it was posted on February 26, 2016, a day after she was seen climbing into the green eclipse. That meant police were looking in the wrong places based on an incorrect timeline. Investigators tried to identify the man in the video to gather information, but they were unable to do so. Multiple law enforcement agencies got involved in the attempt to locate Morgan. Family members spoke to news outlets to share more information about the missing teen. Her disappearance sparked a massive online search due to the huge following she had. She had moved to the Atlanta area only about two weeks before she went missing, leaving nothing but unanswered questions in her absence. Despite investigators' best efforts, they were unable to locate Morgan. They did not know if she left willingly or if foul play was involved. Sherry Keenan said in 2019, there is not a lot of information out there. Morgan is a cold case, but an active cold case with the Atlanta Police Department. Family and friends held a vigil on February 25, 2023, where they remembered the young woman who went missing. When she was only 19 years old. Sherry Keenan said, I am not ready to say goodbye until she is found. She organized a Saturday vigil at the Yellow River Park in Newton County. This was the same park as the one where Morgan was last seen. The next update on the case came on July 27, 2023. It was then that police said they wish they could not make public. The information had prompted investigators to go back and review the case from the beginning. It then led to a search warrant for a property on 2 South Broad Street in Atlanta. Based on the new information, it was suspected that Morgan's remains might be buried there. Police reported that the current owner of the house cooperated with the investigation and was not considered a suspect. The location of 2 South Broad Street is about a 10-minute walk from the park where Morgan was last seen. Authorities searched both the home and the large area of open property. The Porterdale Police Department, in conjunction with the FBI and the Atlanta Police Department, conducted a one-day search on July 27 to retrieve evidence related to the missing person case. There were several tents set up in a wooded area near a large home. Police released videos of FBI agents slowly combing the property in grid formation. Police said after the search that they believe Morgan's life was taken and her body was dumped. Police did not specify what they found that led to this conclusion, since they did not find Morgan's body. Sergeant Michael Walden gave feedback and said that their search led to the location of items of evidentiary interest. However, they could not reveal additional information. Morgan's mom, Sherry, had this to say during the search. I believe Morgan, if she was still here, she would have reached out. Even if she did not want to talk to me, she would have reached out to her grandma. She added that the last time she saw her baby girl, she gave her something to keep her safe. We did not really talk. I gave her a penny though. I told her to put the penny in her pocket and to keep it with her to keep her safe. She was with a friend, but I do not know who he was. They walked off and that was the last time I ever saw her. Sherry referred to an unknown man that was with Morgan before she left for Atlanta. Sherry suspected the new information and the search of the property would unveil something big in her daughter's case. Casey McClure, who runs an organization that provides outreach to exploited women and has helped in the search since it began, said, it all goes back to the couple that was last seen with Morgan. McClure also said that the investigators have spoken directly to the couple acting on a tip. They were identified by officers and were publicly referred to by their last names, Goble and Warren. McClure said, Goble was very sweet and polite and well-mannered and seemed concerned about Morgan. Warren was very rigid. 
On Saturday, August 5, 2023, the City of Porterdale Police Department posted the following on Facebook. Porterdale police officers obtained arrest warrants and two persons have been arrested in this ongoing investigation. Investigators are still actively working on this case and it is continuing to develop while they are in constant communication with our district attorney and his office. Police Chief Jason Cripps said in the arrest announcement that he was grateful for the help of the other agencies. This was finally a new update in the over seven-year disappearance of Morgan. 27-year-old Jonathan Alexander Warren was arrested in Los Angeles in connection to Morgan's case. He was charged with four felonies, taking Morgan's life, hiding that fact, and being aggravated assault and tampering with evidence. In accordance with California law, Warren's mugshot was not released. He apparently lived in the area where Morgan was last seen at the time that she disappeared. Warren has a long list of previous offenses. He has charges of fleeing or attempting to elude, driving without headlights in the dark, and reckless driving. He was 22 years old when he committed these crimes. Most importantly, his address was listed as 2 South Broad Street, Porterdale. This is the same address where the latest search for evidence was done. 27-year-old Caitlin Goble was arrested in Peoria, Illinois, also in connection to Morgan's case. She was charged with two felonies. Concealing the fact that she assisted in taking Morgan's life, as well as tampering with evidence. She is currently being held in Peoria County Jail. Her mugshot was also not released. The nature of the relationship between Morgan and the couple was not confirmed by police. Newton County District Attorney Randy McGinley said his office is hopeful that Morgan's family will soon see justice. I always look at it from the victim's perspective or in this case, the victim's family. This family has been waiting for years, not knowing what has happened. He also said that right now they were still waiting on Warren and Goble to be extradited back to Newton County. So they can begin to review the case files. We do not usually have the entire case file until the arrest is made, so we need time to review the case file," McKinley added. On Monday, August 7, 2023, Morgan's mother was not ready to speak on camera about the news of the arrests, but instead posted an update on the Massive Missing Morgan Facebook page. Sherry Keenan described Morgan as charismatic, gentle-hearted, beautiful and funny. She also said that Morgan was her best friend and that she missed her terribly. What we cannot share is speculation, she wrote. Please understand, legally and currently, Morgan is still considered a missing person. While we are so grateful that arrests have been made, this is an ongoing investigation. Paxton Gilbert, a friend of Morgan, had this to say after the arrests. It is a big shock. They would last two people to be seen with my friend Morgan. I just want to know what happened, you know. They told investigators. They even told her mom. They dropped her off at a gas station, and that is the last they saw of her. The new information that investigators received was an informant that said investigators should take a new look at Warren and Goebel. The evidentiary items found at the couple's home confirmed to investigators that they were responsible for taking Morgan's life. The hope is that the couple will admit to what they did and tell investigators where Morgan's body can be found, can start the healing process. Destiny Renee Pittman was born in Kokomo, Indiana, on January 9, 1992, to parents Melvin Douglas and Carla Pittman McCombs. Destiny was one of five children and had two brothers and two sisters. In 2013, at the age of 21, Destiny was staying with her two young children, her boyfriend, a female roommate, and her husband. And three dogs in 815 James Drive, Kokomo. On the evening of February 7, 2013, two armed intruders forced their way into Destiny's home. Destiny stepped out from her bedroom into the hallway to confront the intruders. She was then fatally shot by one of the attackers. The bullet went through her chest and struck a wall at the end of the hall. Renee's boyfriend, roommate, children and dogs were at home at the time, but hid away out of fear and were unharmed. At approximately 9.33 p.m., officers from the Kokomo Police Department were dispatched to 815 James Drive when they were notified about shots being fired at the residence. When officers arrived at the crime scene, Destiny was already gone. And there was nothing they could do to revive her. A single 40 caliber shell casing was recovered. 
Neither her boyfriend, whose name was never disclosed, or roommate, saw the intruders and could thus not give investigators any description. It was suspected that the perpetrators may have been looking to rob Destiny and her boyfriend of marijuana and cash they had from selling weed. Destiny's boyfriend reportedly admitted to police that he sold marijuana and had taken a bag containing weed and over $2,000 in cash to another house just days prior to the home invasion. Both the boyfriend and the roommate also admitted to police that Destiny, too, was involved in selling, but had not as much since she inherited money. Unfortunately, investigators were unable to identify the attackers, and the case went cold. For more than 10 years, Destiny's case remained unsolved without a single suspect ever being identified. Destiny's demise left her surviving family and friends devastated. Even years after, her mom stayed depressed and cried a lot. My life has turned absolutely upside down. They took my child for no reason. Whoever it was, I hope they are satisfied. They did not get anything out of it. She was just getting ready to start modeling and have a life for herself. Her mother said not knowing who did this to her daughter or why eats at her each and every day. On March 2, 2023, two men were finally identified as suspects in Destiny Pittman's case. Investigators announced the arrest of 32-year-old Joey McCartney and 36-year-old Jesse McCartney. Joey McCartney was taken into custody by U.S. Marshals at the crack of dawn at a residence in Graham, Kentucky. Jesse McCartney was arrested by U.S. Marshals and local police at a residence in Kokomo. Graham and Kokomo are more than a four-hour drive apart. As a result of the continued investigation since 2013, along with citizens continuing to provide leads, investigators with the Criminal Investigation Section were able to determine that these two individuals were responsible for what happened to Destiny. On December 5, 2022, a woman called in and claimed to have information about Destiny's case. She told police she could not keep this information to herself anymore after repeatedly seeing press releases on the case over the years. According to the court documents, this informant claimed to have been with Jesse McCartney on the night Destiny's life was ended, and had been sitting in his white Jeep Cherokee outside Destiny's home. According to the informant, Jesse and Joey said they were running an errand, which the individual reportedly believed meant a deal that involved illegal substances. Jesse reportedly told the informant to stay inside the vehicle while he proceeded to put on black leather gloves and grabbed his handgun. Jesse at Destiny's front door before the pair entered the residence. The two of them then started searching the home, which police believe it was for substances that Destiny and her boyfriend were selling. The informant heard a gunshot and saw both men come running out of the house. Jesse was sweating heavily and had a large bag of marijuana and cash in his hand, according to the informant. She alleges that she and Jesse drove back to his apartment and Joey joined them. She said Jesse then made her drive back by the home the next day. When they drove past, there was police tape surrounding the house. The informant also told police about Jesse McCartney changing his phone number and said he still lived in Kokomo on Monroe Street. She said he sold his gun and Jeep six months later after the crime was committed. The woman told investigators she did not come forward sooner because she was scared and still is. She had an alleged history with Jesse. Lee showed Destiny's boyfriend photographs of Joey and Jesse McCartney after the new revelations. The boyfriend stated that Joey looked familiar and might have visited before with a common but it was still unclear to investigators whether Destiny knew the McCartneys. The two men each faced charges for taking Destiny's life as well as burglary. Jesse McCartney faced additional charges of robbery and possession of illegal substances. The brothers were held without bond for the alleged connection to the case with their hearing taking place in March 2023. Jesse McCartney's trial took place on August 11, 2023, and he was acquitted of some of the charges against him since it was determined he was not the one that shot Destiny. Joey McCartney's trial is yet to take place. Gretchen Eleanor Harrington was born on June 13, 1967, in the quiet town of Marple Township, Pennsylvania. She was the beloved daughter of Harold Boyd Harrington and Ana Cover Harrington. Gretchen had three sisters, Zoe, Anne, and Jessica. The girls grew up in a household filled with love and sibling companionship. Undoubtedly played a crucial role in shaping Gretchen's character and forming cherished memories. 
Her father, Harold Harrington, was a pastor and dedicated his life to serving various congregations of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America. On the morning of August 15, 1975, eight-year-old Gretchen Harrington left her home on 27 Lawrence with her Bible in one hand. She was on her way to go to summer Bible school camp at the Trinity Church Chapel Christian Reformed Church on 140 Lawrence Road. This was the premises of two local churches. Gretchen's father was the pastor of the one church and David Zanstra was the pastor of the secondary church. She was eager to attend Bible school. Usually, she walked the half-mile with her older sisters, Zoe and Harriet. But on this particular day, though, her mom, Ana, was bringing home her newborn baby, Jessica. Zoe and Harriet preferred to stay home and wait for their arrival. Pastor Harrington encouraged Gretchen to go to Bible school to keep up her perfect attendance record. Therefore, Gretchen was all alone as her father waved goodbye to her. She began her stroll up the hill to the church just after 9 a.m. A child walking alone on a sunny summer day in a place like Marple was hardly unusual. It was not regarded as dangerous or risky. This was the 1970s in a leafy suburb. Kids played various games outside till all hours. They played on the streets, in the dark, and in the woods. They cooled off in Darby Creek, which ran behind Gretchen's home without a care in the world. Kids walked to their friends' houses blocks away, no cell phones or GPS watches to tether them to their parents. Marple was as safe as safe could be. At around 9 to 9.30 a.m., the children arrived at the camp, and the first activity on the agenda was a morning exercise session. Led by David Zanstra, the other pastor. At approximately 10 a.m., half of the children were then transported to the Reformed Presbyterian Church for the remainder of the day. Zanstra was one of the people responsible for transporting the children. At 10.30, Gretchen's father became concerned when she had not arrived yet at the second church where he was waiting. Harold began searching Lawrence Road to see if maybe Gretchen had wandered off or went home. When he could not find Gretchen, Harold contacted Zanstra's wife, Margaret, who was at the Trinity Church to find out if Gretchen was still there and if David Zanstra perhaps knew if she was transported to the other church. Margaret told Harold that her husband returned to Trinity Chapel after transporting children. He was somewhere on the property of the church and had not seen Gretchen that day. The Harringtons and Zanstras knew each other well. The two families lived close to one another. Both dads were in the same line of work and both moms filled the stereotypical role of pastor's wife. One of Zanstra's daughters was Gretchen's best friend. When David Zanstra learned that Gretchen's father was looking for her, he called the Marple Township Police Department at Harold Harrington's request and reported Gretchen missing. The call was made at 11.23 a.m. and Zanstra described Gretchen to the police as an eight-year-old girl with blonde hair in pigtails, three feet six inches tall, 50 pounds, wearing dark blue and no visible buttons, and a white top. Quite a detailed description for someone who apparently did not see Gretchen on that day. As the sun set that day just before 8 p.m., there was still no sign of Gretchen. Margaret Sanster brought supper to the Harrington home, where Ina, Gretchen's mother, seemed resigned to the fact that she would never see her daughter alive again. She was just kind of accepting the fact that Gretchen was gone. I do not know whether she was just putting on a brave face. I think she was in shock. Gretchen's disappearance sent shockwaves through Broomall and Marple Township. The people went into full-blown panic mode. By Saturday, hundreds of people were involved in the search for Gretchen. A Pennsylvania State Police helicopter searched the area continuously from above. Friends and family members began handing out flyers to passing motorists in the area. The flyers showed Gretchen in her most recent school photo, sporting a missing tooth and a childish grin. There was a lot of speculation, so many unanswered questions. Had she run away? Did she drown in a creek? Did a stranger kidnap her? Was it somebody she knew? People and church members who searched for little eight-year-old Gretchen said her disappearance destroyed the belief that their community was safe. Karen Frank Zetterberg was a Bible school classmate of Gretchen. They were the same age and lived in the same tightly knit community. After Gretchen's disappearance, Karen's mom took her to the hairdresser to cut her hair real short in order for her to look like a boy. She did not want her daughter to stand out with her long hair. 
Karen was also not allowed to walk alone to her piano lessons and to the swim club anymore. Paul Barton, who lived in nearby Newton Square, heard about the search on his police scanner while he was relaxing in his backyard pool. He soon drove down to Darby Creek to join a search team. His group combed a grassy hill. There was just this very solemn feeling amongst all of us who were out there searching. We went out there not knowing what to expect, what we might find. We were looking for something, anything, but we found nothing. Nobody did. That Sunday, just two days after Gretchen's disappearance, police called off the large-scale search operation. Investigators had little to go on. The police chief told a local newspaper, we haven't got a clue. No useful clues of any kind were found by the search parties. In the weeks that followed, the police spoke with several people to piece together what had happened to Gretchen. On August 17, 1975, the interviews began for the investigation. Witnesses, camp teachers, students, and parents were interviewed by police, providing various important facts for the case. Crucial pieces of information were the observation of either a green station wagon or light top, dark bottom Cadillac stopping to talk to a girl near the church. Another fact that was brought up was that the camp's daily routine was broken on August 15th because the group at Trinity Church stayed 45 to 50 minutes longer than usual. The investigation took a turn on August 19th. When a small pair of shorts were found on a fence post in Westchester, Pennsylvania. David Zancher was called in to talk to police, based around the fact that he provided such a specific description of Gretchen's shorts, although, according to him, he never saw her that day, since she never arrived to camp. The shorts found in Westchester ultimately ended up not being Gretchen's. But investigators were still left questioning how Zanstra knew such specific details about her shorts. When investigators interviewed Zanstra on August 19th, he told them that he had picked up some children and driven them to the church the day Gretchen went missing. He still denied having seen her that day. On October 14th, two months after Gretchen disappeared, a jogger in Ridley Creek State about 20 minutes from Gretchen's home stumbled on human remains. At first, he was not sure what he had found until he saw what was clearly a fingernail. He ran to fetch a park ranger. Gretchen's parents confirmed that the distinctive clothing found with the remains was hers. Ina made the girls' clothes by hand. The remains found were of a small human body, which the autopsy later revealed was indeed Gretchen Harrington's. Dental records were used for identification purposes. Dr. Halbert Feilinger performed the autopsy. He found a cranial cerebral injury and stated that Gretchen had suffered two or more blunt impacts to her skull, leaving her with a depressed skull fracture. Police suspected that she had been assaulted as well. Though the autopsy revealed no evidence of that, the heart-wrenching discovery left everyone mourning the loss of a promising young life. The Sunday after Gretchen's body was found, her father Harold delivered a sermon at church. Gretchen, with her simple faith in Christ, is free, he declared. But the perpetrator is in terrible bondage. The world is filled with unspeakable evil. Because of the wickedness of the human who knows the truth but will not accept it. The discovery in the woods led to a new frenzy of activity in the case. Witnesses came forward with reports of men of various descriptions they had seen in the area where Gretchen was found. Police received numerous tips, some sounding very promising, some completely frivolous. David Zanstra was called back to the police station for a further interview about the morning of August 15th. Zanstra told police that he started picking up children for the opening session at 9.10 a.m. and was finished with the pickups and back at Trinity Chapel by 9.30 a.m. He denied ever seeing Gretchen and told police that he was unaware she was even missing. Until he was called to the Reformed Church at 11.05 a.m. by Harold Harrington, Gretchen's father. Investigators looked into a series of potential suspects, including several known offenders of assault living in the area. Nothing led to an arrest. What happened to Gretchen became a mystery for decades. No one knew who took her life. The case went cold. Joanna Falcon Sullivan was only nine years old in 1975 when Gretchen's slaying took place. She was born and stayed in Brummel, Delaware County at the time. The case had always haunted Sullivan. She became a veteran journalist and wrote a true crime book detailing the ongoing investigation in Gretchen's case. Sullivan said, I grew up in Brummel. 
My co-author Mike Mathis grew up in Brummel as well. He grew up in Lawrence Park where this happened. It affected both of us as kids and it affected a lot of kids our age. Sullivan started the book during the pandemic and Marple's Gretchen Harrington tragedy was released in October 2022. The novel was Sullivan's first book. But she said she does plan to revise this true crime book to reflect any updated information about this case as it unfolds. Naturally, when detectives retire or pass away, other investigators inherit their cold cases. In the case of Gretchen, Sergeant Coffin became the head investigator. When a woman called Marple Police and wanted to talk to somebody about Gretchen, our message went to Coffin's phone. He was sitting at Marple Township Police Headquarters when he heard the voicemail. The woman said she thought she knew who was responsible for what happened to Gretchen and talked about an attempted kidnapping around the same time. She also mentioned that she kept a diary in the 1970s in which she recorded some of this information when she was a 10-year-old girl living in Havertone about three miles east of Marple. The woman still had the diary in her possession after all these years. Sergeant Coffin got in touch with Pennsylvania State Police. Though the case remained open with the Marple cops because Gretchen had last been seen in their jurisdiction, the state police technically became the lead investigatory agency once the remains were found in the state park. Coffin noted, I have four detectives in my division. The state police have so many more resources. State troopers scheduled an interview with the woman. She is designated in court documents only by her initials, SF and CI number one, the terminology used for confidential informant. The interview would turn out to be a monumental development in a cold case that had been unsolved for nearly half a century. And monumental developments in decades-old cold cases do not happen that often. The woman told the state on January 2, 2023, that she had been childhood friends with Gretchen and Zoe Harrington, one of Gretchen's sisters. She was also friends with David Zanstra's daughters, Mara and Kristen, and that she would often play at the Zanstra home. She frequently slept over at their house. During one of these sleepovers, when she was 10, she told the troopers she awoke in the middle of the night to find Pastor Zanstra touching her inappropriately. She shifted her position and he immediately hurried from the room. The next night, he touched her again, she said. When the girls woke up the following morning, the woman said she mentioned David Zanstra's odd behavior to Mara, his one daughter, and then Mara told her something to the effect of, he does that sometimes. And sometimes I hear my sister crying in the middle of the night. When the girl related the incidents to her parents, they told her she was not allowed to sleep over at the Zanstra house anymore. Notably, police believe the incident in question occurred exactly one week before Gretchen vanished. A short time afterwards, the Zanstras moved to Plano, Texas, a Dallas suburb. Also told state police about another child in the neighborhood with whom she was friends, a girl named Holly. According to her, somebody had attempted to kidnap Holly. She wrote the following entry in her diary, which she turned over to the state troopers. In one entry dated September 15, 1975, she wrote, Guess what? A man tried to kidnap Holly twice. It is a secret so I cannot tell anyone, but I think he might be the one who kidnapped Gretchen. I think it was Mr. Z. She confirmed to the troopers that the Z stood for Zanstra. Local police had questioned Zanstra twice back in 1975, along with many other people. Some witnesses had said they saw Gretchen outside a car, talking to someone sitting inside. On the morning she disappeared. Some of the descriptions of the car matched one of Zanstra's, but Zanstra always insisted he had not seen Gretchen on the day in question. Bizarrely though, as you the viewer would already have noted, there was an investigatory gap never explained by Marple Police. Zanstra was able to give an accurate and detailed description of the homemade shorts Gretchen was wearing that day, even though he supposedly had not seen her. Sadly, the original Marple detective in her case passed away in June of 2020, and therefore there is no explanation for the state troopers tracked Zanstra down to a lakefront home in Marietta, Georgia. He and his wife had moved there. Zanstra agreed to meet the troopers at the headquarters of the Cobb County Police Department on July 17, 2023. The troopers questioned Zanstra about Gretchen's disappearance, and he denied any involvement. Then they revealed the newest allegations to him. That the pastor had assaulted his own daughters and a best friend. 
David Zanstra then finally came clean to investigators on what really occurred on the morning of August 15, 1975. Jack Stolsteimer, the Delaware County District Attorney, outlined Zanstra's confession about what happened. Once Gretchen was out of her father's view, Zanstra then invited her into his green AMC Rambler station wagon. Instead of driving her to church, he drove her to a secure wooded area, parked the car, and asked her to take off her clothes. She refused and responded that she wanted to go home. He struck Gretchen with his fist and she began bleeding from her head. After feeling her pulse and her appearing lifeless, he carried her out of the car and attempted to cover her body with sticks. He then left and went on with his day. Due to the nature of the close relationship the Harringtons had with the Zanstras, investigators determined that Zanstra had the means, motive, and opportunity to take Gretchen's life. David Zanstra was taken into custody in Georgia on July 17, 2023. He is currently being held in Cobb County, where he has been denied bail. A DNA sample was collected from Zanstra that would be compared to DNA collected in other open cases in Pennsylvania and across the country. Investigators believe that it is unlikely Zanstra is not involved in other crimes, considering he worked with children for decades. Phil Stoddard, a detective in Marietta, Georgia, who sat in on the Zanstra interview, told a TV news crew there that Zanstra was emotionless during his confession to the troopers. Trooper Eugene Trey conducted the interview. Afterwards, Trey said, I do not know if he is sorry for what he did, but this is a weight off his shoulders for sure. On July 24, 2023, Delco officials announced the arrest of 83-year-old David Zanstra in connection with Gretchen's kidnapping and slaying. Zanstra was born in May 1940. He was still working as a pastor in Georgia at the time of his arrest. Delaware County District Attorney Jack Stolstein said, This heinous act left a family and a community forever changed. At long last, I can announce today that David Zanstra had admitted to this crime. Justice has been a long time coming, but we are proud and grateful to finally be able to give the community an answer. We have to realize that most people in this world are good, and that most pastors, especially people who claim to be men of God, are good people. But there have always been people, and there always will be people, who are this cold-hearted, remorseless and just evil. Thank God there is law enforcement here to hold them accountable. And however long this takes, we are going to do it, because this young lady should be alive. What happened to her is just horrendous. And that his office was seeking a governor's warrant to bring Zanstra to Delaware County. The district attorney's office will submit a petition for requisition. Once approved, arrangements will be made to have representatives from the Delaware County Sheriff's Office pick up Zanstra and bring him to Pennsylvania. The process could take as long as two months. Stolzheimer added, we are going to try him. We are going to convict him and he is going to stay in jail for the rest of his life. Then he is going to have to find out what the God he professes to believe in holds for those who are this evil to our children. He slayed with his bare hands this poor young girl and then lied about it for 48 years. He ended this girl's life that he knew and who trusted him. And then he acted as if he was a family friend, not only during her burial and funeral, but for years. Chief Graff of the police department in Marple Township said during Monday's press conference, if you're a praying person, you can certainly pray for Gretchen, and I do not think she needs it. She is in God's hands. You can certainly pray for the evil man responsible for this. Because he is going to need it. The charges filed against Zanstra have brought a sense of closure to Brummel, Pennsylvania, which has been haunted by Gretchen's case for nearly 48 years. Gretchen's demise had transformed this community. Pre-August, 1975, it was any town, USA. Post that day, it changed everything for the kids. For the parents, for the families, for everybody, because nobody could do anything anymore in the innocence that they used to do it before this happened. Jim Cristaldi, who as a youth delivered newspapers to the Harringtons, spoke fondly of a pre-disappearance childhood in which he and his friends would spend countless hours building forts in the woods with only the light of the moon. But right after Gretchen vanished, Crystal, a teenager at the time, found himself in search parties in those same woods looking for Gretchen or anything that might have led to her whereabouts. We were innocent and this absolutely shattered our innocence. 
Pennsylvania State Police Lieutenant Jonathan Sunderland said in a statement, The residents of the Commonwealth can have confidence that law enforcement will not rest until justice is served. This case has been investigated by generations of detectives, and they all are owed a debt of gratitude for never giving up. Particular recognition is due today to Corporal Andrew Martin of the criminal investigation his determination to build upon the work of his predecessors and his belief that the case could still be solved have been instrumental in getting us to today's announcement. Michel Delon, president and CEO of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children said, Today's announcement is a testament to the power of perseverance and a family and community's commitment to justice. Regardless of how much time has passed, we know answers can be found. As we mark this achievement, we applaud the incredible efforts of the Delaware County District Attorney's Office, the Pennsylvania State Police, the Marple Township Police, and their partner law enforcement agencies, and the Cobb County Police Department for their unwavering dedication in this case. Protect children, and we're keeping Gretchen's family in our thoughts, as well as the many other families out there who are still searching for answers. David Zanstra has been charged with taking Gretchen's life in the first, second, and third degree, as well as kidnapping of a minor and the possession of an instrument of crime. The website of the Christian Reformed Church lists Zanstra as a retired minister and said he was ordained on September 20, 1965. In addition to the Trinity Chapel Christian Reformed Church in Brummel, Zanstra also served at churches in New Jersey, California, and Texas between 1965 and 2005. The Christian Reformed Church said in a statement on Monday that it wanted to extend their condolences to the family of Gretchen Harrington. We are additionally grieved to hear that a CRC pastor has been arrested in the case. We recognize that we live in a broken and sinful world where violence can happen anywhere by anyone, even within our churches and by leaders we hold to the highest standards. David Zanstra's wife, Margaret Zanstra, did not immediately respond to a request for comment after her husband's arrest. While the Marple community now has most of the answers it had been seeking for all these decades, many of the residents had not found peace in the shocking turn of events. It was much easier to believe that some outsider had done this. Some deranged, itinerant offender who had somehow wandered into town, snatched up a young girl, and then disappeared just as quickly, taking his evil with him to whatever unfortunate place he landed next. Instead, it was a respected member of their community, a religious leader with a wife and young girls of his own, a wife who had brought supper to the family of the girl he's confessed to slay. Karen Frank Zetterberg, Gretchen's Bible school classmate, observed. Back then, everybody was surprised that Gretchen would get into a car with a stranger, and now to find out that this monster was hiding amongst us in plain sight all the time, it is just sickening. We were always taught in church that evil exists in the world, but you do not really understand evil until something like this happens. We were far too young to learn about evil the way we did. Sullivan who wrote the book on Gretchen's case said after the announcement, I was stunned. The fact that this case is finally, potentially coming to a close, it is very exciting to hear this news. It is still very sad you know. We cannot change what happened. I interviewed Zanstra, his wife, and his daughter when doing research from my book. Zanstra had a murky recollection of the day Gretchen went missing. There was a sense of fear and apprehension in Brummel. I remember seeing a helicopter flying over our neighborhood in a search effort for Gretchen. That image stayed with me for the rest of my life. Sullivan's book was just released last year, and CBS News Philadelphia talked to her about whether she believed it may have led to a break in this case. Sullivan replied, we started interviewing people. We went to Marple Police Department and were able to comb through the cold case files kept by Chief Brandon Graff, who never gave up on this unsolved case. Marple Police encouraged our research and said that we somehow contributed. I think we got people talking again. Reverend Zanstra took our calls. He answered questions about that day. There's a lot of relief and disbelief that it is actually happening. David Zanstra's neighbors in Georgia also reacted after learning about the charges against him. Karen Alstorf said it is shocking. I had no idea. They have just always been very nice people. Aaron Christian said, friendly guy, I talked to him a few times. I see him walking around with his cane. The family of Gretchen Harrington released the following statement. 
With today's announcement of an arrest, we are extremely hopeful that the person who is responsible for the heinous crime that was committed against our Gretchen will be held accountable. It is difficult to express the emotions that we are feeling as we take one step closer to justice. Gretchen was only eight years old when she was suddenly taken away from us on her way to church on Friday, August 15, 1975. If you met Gretchen, you were instantly her friend. She exuded kindness to all and was sweet and gentle. Even now, when people share their memories of her, the first thing they talk about is how amazing she was, and still is. At just eight years old, she had a lifelong impact on those around her. The kidnapping and demise of Gretchen has forever altered our family, and we miss her every single day. We are grateful for the continual pursuit of justice by law enforcement, and we want to thank the Pennsylvania State Police for never stopping in their constant search for answers. We would not be here today if it was not for them. As a family, we ask for privacy at this time as we continue to digest this information. Thank you for your understanding, love, and continued support. It means the world to us. Gretchen's parents were married for an impressive 59 years. Her father passed away in 2021 at the remarkable age of 94. Officials said Zanstrom moved around quite a few times to different churches during his 40-year tenure. He lived in California, Texas, and Georgia. Stolsteimer said, We are concerned that there may be more victims who might have been assaulted by this man. We want to hold him accountable for everything he did. We need to be diligent. If anyone has any information about that. If David Zanstra ever committed an act against you, please reach out to District Attorney Joffrey Payne or the Pennsylvania State Police. From what should have been a 10-minute walk down the road, turned into a cold case that gripped a whole community for nearly 50 years. Sandy Point is a coastal town located in Victoria, Australia. It is situated on the southeastern coast of the country, near the entrance to the Gippsland Lakes. Sandy Point is known for its beautiful sandy beaches, making it a popular destination for beachgoers and water sports enthusiasts. The area also offers opportunities for fishing, bird watching, and other outdoor activities. On Christmas Day in 2017, a snorkeler made a startling discovery at Shallow Inlet in Sandy Point. The snorkeler found human remains on the ocean floor. The remains were devoid of tissue, clothing, or personal effects. Almost the entire skeleton was uncovered in a near-perfect condition beneath the sand. With no context or clues to the man's identity, Victoria Police reported the finding to the coroner and transferred the remains to the Victorian Institute for Forensic Medicine. As the team of experts began their scientific tests, they were able to infer some characteristics of the unknown person. The forensic anthropologist determined that the remains belonged to a Caucasian male aged between 21 and 37 years who stood at approximately 170 centimeters tall. The forensic odontologist who delved into the dental restorations noticed that work done on the teeth hinted at the fact that the person lost their life a very long time ago or were not from Australia. The man's upper jaw was recovered, but not the lower jaw. Radiocarbon testing was not able to illuminate the timeline. It indicated a 95% probability that the individual lived between 1666 and 1942, which is hardly specific. A nuclear DNA profile and a mitochondrial DNA profile were obtained from the remains. The DNA profile information was compared to the Victorian missing persons DNA database, but no match was found. The DNA profile was also uploaded to the National Criminal Investigation DNA database for identification purposes, with no match. Since he could not be identified, the man was named the Sandy Point John Doe. At one point, there was speculation that the remains could have been those of Martin Weiberg. Martin was a ship's carpenter aboard the SS Avoca, who in 1877 managed to steal 5,000 gold sovereigns that would be worth millions of dollars today. Martin was caught and arrested on October 29, 1878. He spent six weeks in custody and went to the Tarwin River to show police where the rest of the gold sovereigns were hidden. During the search, Weyberg punched one of the officers in the stomach and ran into nearby bushes. He managed to evade police capture for five more months. Weyberg met up with police again on a bush track near Eagle Point in Painesville, Australia. He was arrested, taken to Melbourne and sentenced to five years of hard labor. 
Once released, Weiberg traveled to Hobart and purchased a yacht. He sailed the yacht back to Waratah Bay in Gippsland, parked the yacht, and rowed a small boat to shore to collect supplies. But when he tried to row back to the yacht, the weather turned bad. His small boat was found washed ashore the next day, and Weiberg is presumed to have drowned. But his body was never found. Of course, the only way of finding out if the remains belonged to Martin Weiberg would be modern DNA technology. The Victorian Institute for Forensic Medicine was determined to discover the identity of this unknown man. Recently, they embarked on a program to explore the use of forensic genetic genealogy to solve several Australian cold cases including this cold case. Forensic evidence was sent to Othram's laboratory in the woodlands. Texas and Othram scientists used forensic-grade genome sequencing to develop a comprehensive DNA profile. Once Othram developed the DNA profile, it was returned to investigators, who then uploaded the profile to genealogical databases. The investigative research resulted in a compelling lead that Sandy Point John Doe was Mr. Christopher Luke Moore, a Gippsland farmer and World War I veteran who was thought to have drowned in Waratah Bay in 1928. He enlisted for the war, aged 18, serving for more than 18 months for the 10th Field Artillery Brigade. Police and coronial documents reveal that Christopher was at Waratah Bay with his parents, Cornelius and Charlotte, brother Francis, wife Elizabeth, and toddler Mary when he got into difficulty in the waves on December 30, 1928. A beachgoer tried to save him, but the tide was too strong. Cornelius Moore spent ten long days searching the coastline for his son. Without success. Unearthed historical records unveiled an interesting twist. Mere weeks after Christopher's potential drowning, a local Sandy Point farmer discovered a mandible at Shallow Inlet. Christopher's father, recognizing the distinct dental work, confirmed the mandible as his son's. The coronial inquest held on January 24, 1929, officially validated this identification. Recently, the Victorian Institute for Forensic Medicine's findings were shared with the state coroner. A possible grandniece of Christopher Luke Moore was identified, residing in Gippsland, Australia. Police contacted this vital link to history, and she graciously cooperated, confirming the family's account of Christopher's drowning. And the subsequent recovery and burial of his mandible. To establish an irrefutable familial connection, the grandniece provided a DNA sample. Through confirmatory DNA analysis, the truth was confirmed. Sandy Point John Doe was indeed Christopher Luke Moore. The discovery was made in July 2023. It is confirmed that Christopher accidentally drowned and no foul play was involved. Thanks to the effort of the Victorian Institute for Forensic Medicine and Othram, a 95-year-old case has finally been solved. 12-year-old Jennifer Renee Odom was a 7th grader at Thomasy e. Waitman Middle School in Wesley Chapel, Florida, in 1993. She played the clarinet in a school band, and she was also a barefoot water skier who placed high in tournaments. Often she was the skier who climbed to the top of the human pyramid gliding atop the water. Jennifer was born on August 25, 1980. She was the eldest daughter of Renee Converse and stepdad Clark Converse. She had a nine-year-old sister, Jessica and Odom, and was the granddaughter of Jim and Margie Denny. They lived in St. Joseph, a small community near Dade City, Florida. Jennifer and Jessica had a rabbit called Beanie. Jennifer also absolutely loved her Springer Spaniel Gypsy. The two sisters built forts, rode four-wheelers, and spent summer days swimming in the creek behind their house on the family's 15-acre property. It was a crisp morning on Friday, February 19, 1993, when Jennifer Odom put on her white jeans and white turtleneck in order to get ready for school. She put a red cashmere sweater, a gift from her grandmother, over her shoulder-length chestnut-colored hair. She was slim and tan due to spending a lot of time outdoors. On that same morning, after lacing up her pair of black boots, she got into the car with her mother. The two drove 200 yards up the winding Lime Rock driveway to wait for the school bus near their mailbox. Jennifer climbed onto the bus and took her usual spot on the back seat, so she and her mother could see each other until Renee, following behind, turned left to head to work. After school, at around 3 p.m., Jennifer stepped off her school bus, waved goodbye to her friends, and started walking the short 200 yards to her home. 
At about 4 p.m., Jennifer's sister arrived at their home from school to find it locked and unable to enter. She then called their mother to tell her that her big sister was not home yet. Renee Converse then realized Jennifer must not have made it home. She called Jennifer's best friend Michelle, who stated that she saw Jennifer exit the bus and begin walking home. Within hours, deputies launched a wide-scale search. A search party of about 400 volunteers was formed to help scour about 60 square miles of countryside. Family, friends, neighbors, and other volunteers searched for Jennifer. Law enforcement was equipped with police dogs to find comb the rolling groves, pastures, and woods surrounding the tiny Pasco County town of Dade City. Every law enforcement agency in the Bay Area was looking for a blue truck that was seen in the area by some of her classmates. Children riding the school bus with Jennifer remembered seeing an older light blue, unknown model pickup truck slowly following Jennifer down the road in the direction in which she was walking. The children described it as having a silver-painted rear bumper, not chrome, and a trailer hitch with wires hanging and pipes or a ladder in the back. The driver was described by the children as a white male in his 40s with shoulder-length brown hair. The blue truck was the focus of the search parties as investigators believed that the driver may have been involved in the disappearance of Jennifer. As a last resort to find the truck, the FBI, as well as Hernando and Pasco County Sheriff's personnel, worked from a dock in Boathouse as drivers searched Lake Jovita for the vehicle. Six days after Jennifer vanished, on Thursday, February 25th, a man and a woman searching an abandoned orange grove about 10 miles north of Jennifer's school bus stop found her badly decomposed nude body. Her body was found near a horse trail off Powell Road south of Brooksville, amid a cluster of pine trees in the orange grove. She was found viciously assaulted and suffered blunt force trauma to her head. Detectives said she likely lost her life there in the woods, not long after her disappearance. We are not exactly sure how long her abductor kept her captive or when exactly the slaying took place, but we are relatively confident it took place in that field. He added, every one of us, including those in law enforcement, can look at Jennifer as our niece, our sister, our granddaughter, and realize that it is a tragedy beyond tragedy, neither the blue truck nor its driver. While Jennifer's family was still busy with her funeral arrangements, country music star Vince Gill was scheduled to sing at the local Strawberry Festival on Monday, March 1, 1993. Jennifer's stepfather, Clark Converse, said the girls had looked forward to Gill's performance for weeks, hoping they could get him to autograph photos. Before the concert, Clark Converse and Jessica went to the festival to fulfill Jennifer's wish that Gill autograph a photo in which Jennifer and her sister had posed with the singer at a previous concert on January 10th. Between shows, festival vice president Joe Newsom took the three snapshots to Gill, who was eating dinner. Jennifer's stepdad had asked that Gil autograph one for Jessica, one for Jennifer, and one for both girls. Newsom said afterwards, I told Gil this young lady had been slayed and her dad was outside. Gil replied that he remembered hearing about the incident. He who also had a young daughter autographed the photos writing on one to Jennifer. May God be with you. As both Gil and Newsom wept. Before singing the last song, he told the audience about Jennifer. I'm going to try to get through this the best I can, he said, his voice cracking. Gil sang his Grammy-winning hit, I Still Believe in You, and dedicated it to Jennifer, who was tragically robbed of her life. Midway through the song, with tears running down his face, Gil asked the crowd to help him finish. Nearly 15,000 voices joined in. Radio personality Jeff Moore stood backstage and looked out at thousands of tear-stained faces. It was heart-ripping, he said afterwards. Unfortunately, with no one in the community providing investigators with useful information, her case went unsolved. Thirteen months before Jennifer was abducted, on January 16, 1992, a 17-year-old girl was kidnapped as she got off a school bus in north-central Pasco County. She was found in a pool of blood behind an abandoned house, brutally attacked, assaulted, and beaten. Sheriff Neen who has said she suffered injuries to her head and skull that were very significant she survived. But her life was forever changed as she was paralyzed on her left side. Neen who has said she was a former honor roll student and track and field participant and was a true victim. She was not engaged in a high-risk lifestyle. Law enforcement was able to collect DNA from the crime scene at the time. 
Since there were similarities between what happened to Jennifer and the unnamed girl detectives believed the cases may be related. Both victims were adolescent girls who were abducted after getting off of the school bus in Pasco County, taken to a remote field, assaulted, and abandoned with the belief they will succumb to their injuries. The other victim was found just a few miles from where Jennifer's body was found. After a series of blind alleys, the police called upon psychic Nancy Meyer 16 months after the incident to assist in finding the person responsible for what happened. Nancy Meyer is a psychic from Pennsylvania who has been working with police around the country for decades. According to Nancy, she had consulted in more than 300 criminal investigations and had offered critical clues more than 80% of the time. Nancy believed that two men were involved in taking Jennifer's life. She described them as white, muscular mechanics, and she said one may be a smoker with a heavy cough. The crime scene photographs were classified. Therefore, Nancy Meyer was not allowed to see it. Despite this, she was able to visualize two men in detail. She was taken to the site where Jennifer's body was found. Nancy pointed out that there were belongings in a nearby area that had not yet been discovered. She was able to describe several of Jennifer's items that were still missing, including her cousin's clarinet case with the letters L.O. on them. She continued to give information about the perpetrators in hope of solving the case. Detective Carlos Douglas of the Hernando County Sheriff's Office said, Nancy Meyer was extremely accurate on some things that led us to look in other areas that we had not thought of, so we obtained a lot of information from what she had to offer. On December 2, 1994, Jennifer's Unsolved Case was aired on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on national TV. After the show aired, more than 50 phone tips and even more investigative leads from around arrived by mail at the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. A spokesman of the sheriff's office said, the show did for us what we wanted it to do. It got us some more exposure. Despite the new exposure, former Hernando County Sheriff's Major Gary Zorn Smith, who oversaw the investigation in its early years, said the investigators were stumped. He said there was a strong possibility the crime would go unsolved. And what's even worse is that if we solve it, it may take another crime to do it, he said at the time. Approximately two years after Jennifer's body was found, on Thursday, January 5, 1995, a couple hunting for scrap metal in a rural area of Hernando County discovered Jennifer's missing book bag and clarinet case. It was found several miles from the location of her body. Police were able to lift fingerprints from her backpack and clarinet case from what is believed to be the person responsible. Unfortunately, there was never a hit in the database for a suspect matching these fingerprints. Over the years, the case garnered national attention and haunted the Tampa Bay region. Thousands of dollars in reward money offered for tips went unclaimed. Detectives logged tens of thousands of hours chasing leads. Jennifer's family waited for news as the years turned to decades. Jennifer's mother, Renee Converse, wondered if it was somebody Jennifer knew. Clark Converse, Jennifer's stepfather, added, There is a real chance that the person who did it is somebody we have contact with. If they catch someone, we're going to be thrown into the spotlight. Learning how to deal with a trial and confronting this person is going to throw us to square one in learning to deal with this. Renee said she cries a bit more each year. The reality is that Jennifer is gone and will never be in our lives again. Nothing is going to change that. She also said that the family is thankful for what they do know. We are blessed that we have this much closure. We are not looking for her. We know where she is. It is going to be a bittersweet finale. She could still picture her 12-year-old daughter, slim and sun-kissed, waving goodbye at the back window of the Pasco County school bus. It was the last time she would see her brown-eyed firstborn girl. Renee recounts the last words being spoken between the two as, I love you. The couple said they have done everything possible to cooperate in finding Jennifer they wanted the person found so that no one else got hurt. On Monday, February 19, 2007, the St. Petersburg Times reported that it marked 14 years since the unsolved abduction and subsequent slaying of Jennifer. In that same year, members of Hernando County Crime Stoppers handed out special playing cards to inmates at the Hernando County Detention Center. Each card featured a brief description of an unsolved case from around the state and a hotline number. Jennifer's card was the Queen of Diamonds and featured two color photos. 
A website has been set up by the Hernando Sheriff's Office with pictures and information about Jennifer. A slideshow was also put together with photos of Jennifer set to a mournful soundtrack. Hernando County Detective George Lloydgren later on headed the cold case unit. He was armed with the latest DNA technology and a disturbing theory. I believe that there is probably one person, if not more, that would know who is responsible for this, he said. He also believed that person could be a family member or ex-spouse, either protecting the perpetrator or too afraid to come forward. I think the reason people do not want to get involved is they may not want to sit there and have to testify against that individual. Over the years, a couple of anonymous tips came in that led investigators to believe that there are several people out there with more information and the investigators wanted them to come forward. They tried various methods of generating new leads from billboards and a $20,000 reward to a documentary on national TV. Investigators amassed some 1,000 pieces of evidence, took thousands of tips and conducted hundreds of interviews over time to try to determine who took Jennifer's life. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reached out to the sheriff's office and offered to skin every piece of paper in Jennifer's case so it would be readily available. It was more than 75,000 pieces of paper. During all the investigations, there were clues, including the fingerprints on Jennifer's clarinet case and backpack. There were also suspects. Serial offender Frank the Neil Potts was a possible he assaulted a 10-year-old girl in Lakeland in 1993. At the time of the slaying, he was working on a construction site in Pasco County and owned a blue pickup truck, which he allegedly later dismantled. Authorities were unable to link him to Jennifer's case, however. Another possible suspect was Walter Ducarm, who lived in the area at the time of the slaying. His ex-wife claimed that he was responsible for it. However, her testimony was inconsistent. When the case against him was presented to a grand jury, he was not indicted. He was no longer believed to be involved in the case. In February 2015, Detective George Lundgren was contacted by Pasco County Sheriff Chris Nako. According to him, new technology had led to a solid lead in the 1992 case in which the teenage girl was found alive. It was the case investigators believed was linked to Jennifer's. The odds of finding another match, Nako said, was 1 in 7.7 no million, a number with 30 zeros. Lloyd Gren commented, as it is with any of the old cases, because items were collected. It is just now that the technology has advanced. The biological evidence found in the investigation of the 1992 case was tested before February 2015, and detectives got a full DNA profile. Investigators used a DNA procedure known as familial searching, which allows law enforcement by comparing male DNA left at the scene with that of family members. The shortfall of a standard DNA search is that a suspect's genetic fingerprint must be on file in the offender database for law enforcement to make a match. Sheriff Ninhu has said until 2015 there were no leads on that particular piece of DNA. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement compared the DNA to local DNA to see if there were any close matches which would be a family member. The sheriff said they found the DNA match that of Jeffrey Crum, who was in jail at the time. Investigators then obtained DNA samples from Crum's brother, father, and grandfather. A direct comparison between the DNA found on the victim and that of Crum's father found a match. Investigators concluded that Jeffrey Crum she took the girl from the 1992 case by the arm and led her behind the abandoned house, where he hit her head with a blunt object so hard it crushed part of her skull and caused her to lose part of her brain, leaving her paralyzed on the one side. This then finally led to the arrest of Jeffrey Crum, 53 years old at the time, in connection to the 1992 case. It was Crum's arrest in this case, authorities said, that made him a person of interest, reinvigorating an investigation in Jennifer's case. Sheriff El Ninhu has said, when Crum was implicated in the 1992 case, he quickly, almost instantaneously became our number one suspect in Jennifer's case because of the similarities. He also noted that over the years there were suspects. But Crum was not on that list, so he came out of left field in 2015. In 2018, on the 25th anniversary of her daughter's demise, Jennifer's mother told the Times that she and other family members tried to have faith that her case would eventually be solved. I think the investigators would have done anything in the world to have solved this case.
Crum was sentenced to life in prison for the crime he committed in 1992, leaving his victim partly paralyzed. The victim's aunt spoke in court during the sentencing hearing, recounting the lifelong damage he had inflicted. Her aunt said her life stopped that day. She also mentioned Jennifer. A year later, a young lady, Jennifer Odom, was slayed, she said. And that brought back so much different things that today, the perpetrator still has not been caught. The arrest and sentence of Crum gave Detective Lloydgren a new resolve and Jennifer's family new hope that the person responsible will be caught. Detectives then began an intensive investigation and interviewed everyone they could find for the next several years they may have been associated with Crum around the time Jennifer was kidnapped. This information was turned over to the state attorney, and the facts and circumstances were turned over to a grand jury. On July 27, 2023, a month shy of what would have been Jennifer's 43rd birthday, officials announced that they had finally made an arrest in the case, and that prosecutors would seek capital punishment against the accused. State Attorney Bill Glass made the announcement during a press conference. This was just after the Hernando County Sheriff's Office announced that it has charged the 61-year-old Jeffrey Norman Crum with the kidnapping, assault, and slaying of Jennifer 30 years before. Glass also said, and we have the right aggravators in this particular case to treat it as a capital punishment case. This is every parent's nightmare. This is the thing that keeps parents up at night, worried about their children. Detective George Lloydgren, who had spent years investigating Jennifer's case, said, shock is probably the best word to describe the reaction of Jennifer's family when he told them about the arrest. He did it quickly because I did not want to get emotional. It is a lot for them to take in and absorb, and I can imagine it is going to take some time before it really sinks in. According to Sheriff Ninhuas, every viable lead for the past 30 years, including those that came from the Pasco County Sheriff's Office or the Florida Department of Law Enforcement or private citizens were investigated thoroughly. He added, the investigation never stopped. Hundreds of items were tested and retested every time new technology came out in the hope of finding a smoking gun to solve this case. The sheriff added, countless, literally countless detectives and sworn law enforcement personnel and civilian and tipsters have had a hand in this investigation. The minute Crum was identified as a suspect in the case, Detective Lundgren went to work putting a mosaic together, or a puzzle, and I can tell you other than the conviction in a previous case, there was no other piece of the puzzle. That was a big piece of the puzzle. Every other piece of the puzzle that got us to this point were tiny little fragments that gave the state attorney and the grand jury enough confidence to indict Crum. Sheriff Neen who has also said that they are searching for additional victims. Authorities fear Crum may be responsible for other crimes. A picture of him from 1993 was released, asking that anyone who recognized him from the 1980s and 1990s to contact Sheriff Neen who is. We urge anyone who had interactions with this individual has information on other crimes he may have committed and or may have themselves been a victim of Jeffrey Crum to reach out to the Hernando County Sheriff's Office and speak to our cold case unit. Despite keeping a lot of information close to the vest, authorities did say that in 1992, Crum worked in construction as a drywall installer and lived on Somerset Lane in Spring Hill, the Pasco County area where Jennifer was abducted from. His residence was about 21 miles from the place where Jennifer was last seen, and 12 miles from where her body was found. Officials also say at that time he drove a blue truck. During Thursday, July 27, 2023's press conference, Sheriff Neen who was kept reiterating Crum was not on the investigator's radar until the past few years. Records showed Crum has a significant history of convictions for violent crime. The sheriff said Crum had been arrested in the early 1980s for armed robbery in Hillsborough County. In 1985, he was charged with kidnapping, assault, and false imprisonment in Hillsborough County. He was arrested by Tampa police in 1987 for carrying a concealed weapon. In 1988, he was caught again carrying a concealed weapon and was charged with aggravated assault. In 1998, he was arrested for domestic violence in Hernando County three times. In 2001, he was arrested for violation of probation in Hillsborough County. He was arrested a few years later for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon in Hernando County. In 2015, he was arrested in Pasco County for aggravated assault on a child under the age of 12. 
Sheriff Ninhu has stated he is a bad individual who enjoyed violence. Crum is already serving two life sentences for the assault and kidnapping case out of Pasco County that was prosecuted around 2015. He is currently in the Hernando County Jail. Judge Curdy Hitsman ordered him to be held without bond and appointed a public defender to represent him. Communities in Pasco and Hernando counties were on edge after Jennifer Odom's kidnapping and slaying back then. They shared their thoughts and feelings after the news of the arrest was announced. Jeannie Cameron, the general manager at Papa Joe's Italian restaurant in Brooksville, said she and others in the community remember hearing about her disappearance all too well. So we all remember hearing about her disappearance, Jennifer's, and about the blue truck and everybody was on alert about looking. I think the bottom line was finding out who did it and getting him off the streets so that another family doesn't have to be tormented. Because I really feel like the whole community was tormented until they found out the answer. Joseph Giaratana, the owner of Papa Joe's Italian restaurant, said, Back then, 30 years ago as a parent, I was very angry that someone could do something like that to a child and then leave her there in the middle of nowhere. Jessica Ellis said she went to Waitman Middle School with Jennifer and played in the same clarinet section in band class. I would say we saw each other a lot. We weren't like close friends, but we knew a lot of the same people. We rode the school bus every day, and I just remember her always being nice, with me and everyone else that rode her school bus that knew her. You know, a lot of us are parents ourselves now. The fact that anyone would do this to a child, it makes me hold my five-year-old a lot tighter now. Grief and fear followed in the days, months, and years after Jennifer lost her life. The arrest of Crum is closure for many in the community. Monica Faye Pritchett was born on February 16, 1979 in Anniston, Alabama. She was the daughter of Donald and Dorothy Pritchett and had two sisters as well as two brothers. Monica married Jeremy Rollins, her high school boyfriend, and they stayed in Heflin, Alabama. They had a stable marriage until the birth of their second son, Aaron, for reasons they never made public. The couple decided to live separately. This was despite Monica being pregnant with their third child. Monica and the boys moved into their Sugar Hill Road home in mid-2001. Jeremy Rowland still had visitation rights to visit his two sons every other weekend. Monica loved her children dearly. Dalton was six years old and Aaron two years old. She was very excited about her third son's arrival in only a few weeks. Monica planned on naming him Shane. She was a busy mom, balancing a full-time job and raising her two sons. She worked at a daycare called Kitty Castle until July 2002, when she accepted a higher-paying job at ITC Deltacom. Monica and her sons visited her father, Donald Pritchett, after work, at his home in Anniston. He had a gift for his oldest grandson Dalton and could finally give it to him. The gift was a foal. Dalton named it Mojave. The evening was filled with horseback riding, playing, dinner, and conversation. At 8.30 p.m., Monica and the boys headed back to their Heflin home. They planned to return later that weekend to spend more time with Monica's father and his wife. However, when the weekend passed without any further word from Monica, relatives decided to go check and make sure everything was all right. When they arrived at Monica's mobile home on Monday morning, September 16th, nothing could have prepared them for what they would find. Had been brutally slayed inside their home. It seemed as if Monica went into labor from shock during the attack. The baby was found partially delivered and not alive anymore. Two-year-old Aaron was found alive and unharmed hiding in a closet, a relative called 911. The same day of the discovery, Jeremy Rollins, Monica's ex-husband, ended his 12-hour shift at Southwire around 6 p.m. and went home. A few hours later, officers arrived at his house and told him what had happened. They asked him to come to the police station. According to officials, Jeremy Rollins was quickly ruled out as a potential suspect and was cooperative throughout the investigation. After being ruled out, Jeremy said how he felt when he learned about what happened to Monica and Dalton. It was unbelievable. There, where I was at, somebody was telling you something that you just cannot believe. Early press reports indicated that Monica and Dalton had both lost their lives due to stab wounds received at some point over the weekend. Everybody pretty much knows everybody when you live in a small town. 
And with a population of less than 3,500 people, Heflin is one of those towns. When something as horrible as a triple slaying occurs somewhere like Heflin, it rocks the very foundation of the community, especially when the victims were a young pregnant mother, a six-year-old son, and her unborn son. The crime terrified the community, and people started improving security measures on their homes and kept their kids inside. Family members described Monica as an easygoing, loving mother who was always smiling and good with kids. Debbie Clark, owner and director of Kitty Castle, said she was just always smiling, just a good person. Her little boy he was so precious. Funeral services were held for both Monica and Dalton on September 19, 2002, at Dryden Funeral Home Chapel. They were set to be buried at the Cedar Creek Cemetery, but prior to the burial, investigators decided they needed to collect more DNA for investigative purposes. On September 20, 2002, Governor Siegelman offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person who committed this terrible crime. Very few details about the slaying were made public, even years later. The Heflin Police Department kept the details confidential as an investigative technique. They believed that the perpetrator would one day mention something about the slaying that was never made public, leading to an arrest. Captain Joe Neighbors of the Alabama Bureau of Investigation confirmed that DNA, fingerprints, and other evidence had been collected at the scene and were sent to the Alabama Department of Forensic Science for analysis. At the time, the department was facing serious backlog issues due to budget constraints, which created a delay in processing. In June 2014, Heflin Police Chief A.J. Benefield contacted the Attorney General offices cold based on new information, they began to interview people again. They met with the State Bureau of Investigation and local prosecutors and started new discussions. Police Chief Benefield was an officer at the time of the slayings. He and his partner responded to the 911 call of the relative who found Monica and her son's bodies. When talking about the case in 2014, Benefield had this to say. So really, there were three victims. It was the worst crime scene I have ever seen. Not a day goes by that we are not talking about this or working on it in some way. It is very near to our hearts. In 2015, Benefield hinted that they were looking at someone that they have known about since 2002, but he did not elaborate further. In March 2015, the Alabama Attorney General's office joined the investigation. Authorities periodically posted on social media asking for information on the case. Unfortunately, no useful leads came in, and the case went cold for some time. In 2021, the case was reopened by Chief McGlawn and Captain Scott Bonner. They resent multiple items to forensic labs, both private and state. They continued to keep close contact with some of the family members and tried their best to provide support as much as they could. Although they could not go into specific details due to the ongoing investigation, Captain Scott Bonner said there was a suspect and evidence. There is no threat to anyone from the suspect in this case at this time. The suspect, who I cannot name yet, is in jail in another state for unrelated crimes. He said, With help from the state, grant money from Seasons of Justice, and a literal truckload of evidence, investigators were able to make an arrest more than 20 years after the crime. Lewis Landon Spivey was arrested on June 26, 2023, and charged with taking the lives of Monica, Dalton, and Shane. Heflin Police Department made the announcement to the public. Lewis Spivey kept the sordid secret to himself until he was released from a Florida prison. He is now 39 years old and was 18 years old when he committed that horrendous crime in 2002. They were acquaintances, Captain Bonner said in a press conference. They had a relationship. Bonner did not reveal a motive or the circumstances leading up to the slayings. For the last 15 years, Louis Spivey has been sitting in a Florida prison cell for an unrelated robbery and aggravated assault case out of Bay County, for which he was sentenced in February 2010. Captain Bonner and Chief McGlawn took Louis Spivey into custody after his release from the Florida prison. Captain Bonner explained, Louis Spivey has since cooperated with the investigation. He was looked at early on in the investigation by other agencies before we opened up the case. Good investigation work gave us some good leads. We did not have surveillance, pictures or cameras, said Bonner. We did not have the things that you would have nowadays. 
When investigators sat down with Louis Spivey, he allegedly gave them a complete confession, outlined the crime, and took sole responsibility for the slayings. A bond hearing was held on June 29, 2023. The court determined that the criteria for invoking Anaya's law had been met, leading to Louis Spivey's continued pretrial confinement without the possibility of bond. Anaya's Law is a legislation named after Anaya Blanchard, a college student whose life was tragically taken in 2019. The law aims to enhance penalties for certain violent offenses in Alabama. It allows judges to deny bail or parole for individuals charged with certain violent crimes, ensuring that they remain in custody throughout their trial process. The law seeks to prioritize public safety and protect potential victims by keeping individuals considered dangerous off the streets during legal proceedings. Investigators gave few details on what led to the break in the case, but we do know about the confession and that the department was given a grant for DNA analysis and several items were processed by a state lab and private labs in Canada. In a statement on behalf of Mayor Robbie Brown, Chief Ross McGlawn offered his condolences to the family of Monica and Dalton. Hopefully this will bring you some sense of closure to this awful chapter in your lives. We would like to extend our deepest gratitude and appreciation to Captain Bonner, the Heflin Police Department and all the other agencies and individuals who displayed unwavering dedication and determination in their pursuit of justice for Monica, Dalton and their grieving family. It was definitely the hardest case and I have worked several similar cases in my career, explained investigator and Captain Scott Bonner. The box of reports and everything we had to go through, that alone took several months. This case proved to become personal to Bonner. He admitted he has probably spent more time with Monica and Dalton's family over the last three years than he had with his own. I have become really close to them, he said. It makes me feel great that I can give them some peace. Jeremy Rollins, Monica's ex-husband, remarried in 2011 and has twin daughters with his wife. Aaron Rollins, Monica's second son, graduated high school in 2018 and is now in his early 20s. The family still resides in Heflin. Louis Spivey was transferred to the Cleburne County Jail, where he is now being held without bail and awaiting trial.